this equation, which is all of the parents of all of these K-12 students. So um, as you think about the supports for parents, trying to go back to work, trying to do online learning at the kitchen table, you know, what do you think is needed to really help support parents as they're, they're home this fall if they are in hybrid or, or fully virtual settings? Well, first of all, I, I, I agree with Councilman Traeger. I mean, the interest of parents and teachers and people in schools is most of the time right on the same page. They want the best and teachers and parents stepped up in a terrible challenge to figure out how to move forward with no advance notice. That being said, the real issue now is we need money and we need the federal government and we need, frankly, the Senate and Mitch McConnell to put money into the next bill that directly goes to education. You know, the House passed the HEROES Act, the Senate Democrats, Senator Schumer, Senator Gillibrand put a bill on the table that would give money to education as well as money to the state, which desperately needed and to municipalities. But the bottom line is to do these things and to do them well, whether they're broadband, whether they're teacher preparation, whether they're parent uh, assistance, Every aspect of doing this better requires money and investment, and particularly to ensure safety across the board. So we just cannot leave that out of the conversation. This is where the governor is right. We have one place to plead for money and to make the case that this is the patriotic thing for Americans to do, support New York, all of New York at a time of need. So we need money. We need a willingness to work together and, and as, as John Lou said at the beginning, we need to lower the temperature and about politics and make the conversation really about kids, number one, because that's why we care about this, the kid part. And then we can find common ground. There is common ground between teachers, administrators, and parents, but we need help. We need money. And the other thing we need, we need the broadband companies to donate statewide and get out of the profit making business during this period and make broadband free for every family that has distance learning and every school. This idea that you're going to charge now in the middle of this pandemic, even a reduced fee is ridiculous. This is a moment to do the patriotic thing and ensure everyone has broadband. Um, Mark, as a, a representative of principals and school administrators, you know, I'm, I'm curious about how you see parents and principals working together, uh, you know, to, to together come and try to support students. Uh, what would be needed to do that? And, and what would that even look like? Well, I, I mean, look, that's what we've been doing for hundreds of years, right? Uh, you know, we, we, we don't, we can't be successful without having the parents and our staffs on our side as one team. And it doesn't mean that we're going to see eye to eye on everything every time. But there are a couple of critical things that have to happen, right? There has to be trust. And, and you build trust over time. You build trust by being honest with people, looking them in the eye and telling them, you know, this is what we can deliver and this is what we can't deliver. This is what can happen and this is what can happen. This is how we can work together. We're going to have programs for you that help you to help your children. Um, we're, we're, we're not going to judge you based on, you know, any uh, type of achievement that your child is or isn't having. We're going to, we're going to create this community together. We're going to be as, as school leaders and, and staff members outside greeting your children when they walk in the door. We're going to be outside at dismissal. We're going to be talking to them about things in their lives that are interesting, things that they like to do. We're actually going to become, you know, really a part of the community and a part of their families for the period of time that they're with us so that we take a genuine interest in the students, a genuine interest in the families, because when we work together like that, that is how we get growth from, the, from our students. And right now at this time, there's another thing that we're going to need to keep that trust and that bond. And that's a little bit of time. September 8th, teachers kind of come back to our buildings to join us. We have uh, safety protocols to go through. We have instructional protocols to go through. We have programming and coordination protocols to go through. We cannot expect our students to come back on September 10th, look our families in the eyes and say, we got this. Because we're going to need to build the time to be able to answer the questions that they have to the best of our ability. And again, we're going to need to be honest. And that is probably the key here. When we make a mistake, we need to own it. 
when we have something to tell them, we need to tell them and we need to hear from them and it's gotta be a back and forth. So the, the idea of parents and teachers and school administrators working together is an age old idea and any successful school has been doing that already and will continue to do so. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, Senator Liu, I'd like to come back to you. Um, we see this rapid shift to remote learning and, and I think that our educators are getting better at it, our parents are getting better at it, even our students are getting better at it. Uh, but surely it might have some potential drawbacks. What concerns you about this rapid shift to remote learning and what are some ways that we can mitigate some of those risks or concerns about completely transitioning over to a virtual learning environment? A number, of those, a number of my pa fellow panelists have already talked about the rapid uh, transition to remote learning in March uh, with no, as Michael said, uh, with no preparation whatsoever. And, uh, and that, that was a very difficult period, but uh, as was also mentioned for the fall, I do agree that, that remote learning, remote teaching will be easier just because uh, more teachers have uh, not only been exposed to it, have had some practice already, but are now given more training and tools by which to improve their teaching via remote methods. I will tell you, I had to go to remote learning within a week, at, uh, remote teaching within a week as well with the university class that I teach. Uh, we went straight to remote learning. In uh, three weeks, I go to a hybrid model where I will be in person uh, for some of the classes and strictly by Zoom in other classes. And even when I'm present, it, uh, two thirds of the class will be coming in by Zoom. So uh, there are all sorts of methods that teachers as well as the other staff in the school's principals are being exposed to and given the proper training and tools to improve on. Um, going forward though, I think uh, the, the challenges are that well, the, the most basic challenge is the, the simple premise that remote learning can never, can never uh, replace, supplant in-person learning in any way. The, the live interaction, not only between the student and the teacher, but between the teacher and the collective body of students, as well as the interaction between students within the classroom, that can't be replicated online uh, in Zoom or otherwise. So, uh, so we do need to get, a, get back to uh, in-person, in-classroom learning as soon as it's safe to do so. And again, it is incumbent upon all of us policymakers, everybody in government to, to, to uh, uh, convince. It's on us to convince the parents and the families that it is safe to do so. It is on us to work very closely hand in hand with our principals who have to answer to their parents much more so than uh, Senator Mayer or I or Councilman Traeger ever have to. I mean, we answer to a lot of parents, but nothing like what the principals have to face on a day-to-day -day basis. And the teachers, of course, uh, understanding, consulting with them about what they are feeling, what they need to feel safe, not only for them to feel safe in the classrooms, but for them to feel that their kids are safe in the classroom. So uh, we do want to get back to in-person learning as soon as it's safe. However, I will also say that, um, you know, it's, it's been a very difficult time and notwithstanding the very rapid transition to remote learning, I, I believe there are some things that are here to stay. And some component of, of remote learning can be used to supplement in-person learning going forward indefinitely. There are in some situations where remote learning actually has worked even better for certain kinds of students, for certain types of subject material. And we, so we should try to take the best of both worlds going forward. And uh, I would also suggest that the DOE look to see what other practices and other models, uh, school systems and other cities and even in other countries have already adopted. There have been some really fantastic okay. success stories that I think we don't need to reinvent the wheel on here in New York City, but we can learn from other places to, uh, to really enhance the learning for our own students here in New York City. Uh, thank you. Uh, you know, Michael, uh, Senator Liu's comments reminded me of a conversation that we had 
about the need for rigorous curriculum and engaging curriculum and, and what does rigorous and engaging curriculum look like that works both remote but also hopefully works in a similar way when we come back to school. Uh, would you mind speaking to that and sharing kind of your, your vision for the types of curriculum that teachers are looking for in this time? Sure, we were working on a massive project before COVID uh, of redoing all of the curriculums in the city of New York and actually starting to align them more so that teachers could work better in terms of a team concept. Uh, so they would be on the same timing, scope and sequence uh, is what we call it, uh, and working with the same type of material so we could spend more time in smaller group instructions and different things that we know are much more effective for the outcomes for students. Remote learning now has placed upon us this challenge that we can't do remote learning and or a blended learning model without massive coordination that we've never seen before in our profession. So we, what, uh, so this challenge before us is, is what uh, Mark was talking about before when he said we need time to work this out. As Mark and I and our teams have spoken about this all summer, um, with the Department of Education, most teachers have no clue that this challenge is going to be before them when they walk into schools on September 8th. And uh, uh, so when he says uh, we need time to figure this all out, so I'm the teacher inside of a classroom and I'm the live teacher in the building, I have to coordinate with the remote teacher who's working with the same students when they're not inside the building. It's probably not going to be the same teacher. So you have to get all of this coordination. The, so the idea that we could load all of this curriculum with the supporting materials into each school's educational platform and then into each classroom would be a great enhancement and something that we should look towards keeping going into the future for education. The challenge we face here right now is we don't, you, you, this is not something you can make happen in one day of professional development. It's going to take a little bit longer. Uh, besides, you know, the safety piece, you're telling, and you, if you honestly believe that when teachers walk in the building, they're going to want to hear all about this new, uh, this whole new uh, co coordination you have to do on curriculum. No, the first thing they wanna, they're going to want to hear is, is this school safe? Are the procedures in place? Is my PPE here? Because parents and teachers are both in the middle of this fearful dilemma, and it's a reality. And it's real, it's not made up, it's a fearful dilemma that they are all, both parents and teachers are facing. And we have to help them get through this, but the way to help people get through this is by facts, transparency on safety. And then we can tackle the great challenges that we know we were, we're about to face in terms of education. I, I'm very, very fearful for everyone in this position, but my biggest fear right now is that it seems that the city of New York is just hell bent on making it a political statement of opening the schools on September 10th and they're going to break the trust between the schools and the community and that is something we're going to fight against because that's really the worst thing that could ever happen because what we saw between March and the end of June is that trust between the teachers and the school community actually became stronger than ever and, and, and we have to make sure things are safe so that we can then take on the greatest educational challenges we've ever had to face as a school system. And you can't do that when people are in this fearful state of mind, both parents and teachers, because do you think the parents are gonna to wanna to hear from us? Oh, we're trying to coordinate our curriculum. Their first question to every teacher is, my child went to school today, is he safe? Is she safe? Are they bringing the virus back to my house? That's the reality of what teachers are gonna to have to face and principals are gonna to have to face. So we have, we understand this challenge. We think we have ways of really meeting it, but first we have to be realistic about what we have to get work through before we can get to that challenge. Yeah, I, I think that your, your point about safety is critical and I think we need to transition there in just a moment. But before we do, um, I, I wanna highlight an idea you had because it's something that I see as being really important is that because of the circumstances, we see this rapid innovation, uh, both by teachers, by the private industry, by even departments of education to really rethink about learning experiences and learning experiences that can be replicated in classrooms, out of classrooms, combinations. 
but also learning experiences that can be personalized for students. Um, right now, teachers are so used to like juggling five different platforms, an assessment system here, a supplement here, a core curriculum here, a novel. And we're seeing that we, we're starting to recognize that that might be a crazy way to do teaching and learning and, and bringing mm -hmm. resources together into a coordinated way, not only makes the teacher more effective, but also makes it easier for the student to learn. And so I think your ideas about curriculum are powerful. I didn't want to lose that. Uh, we're going to go to a really hot button topic. So we'll just, I'd, I'd like to just go down the list and have everybody say something that hasn't been brought up before. But we all, it seems like everyone believes that in-person learning is best, but in-person learning must be safe. And so I guess the question for everyone, if we'll go down the line is, what would be the top of your list that would have to be in place to make you and your constituents feel that the schools are safe to go back for in-person learning? Um, I wanna start with uh, Council Member Traeger and then we'll just, we'll just go down that list and go to unmute yourself and, and we'll have maybe bullet point some items here. It's, it's a trifecta, uh, testing, money, and time. Uh, if you're waiting two weeks for test results, uh, I'm not interested in what they're talking about, the infection rates. If, it's, if it takes two weeks to get test results back, that's not gonna work. Uh, you need uh, resources to operationalize safety plans, which right now we just don't have enough of, and you need time to operationalize this, and if you wanna do this the safe way. So testing, time, and money. Thanks. Uh, Mr. Canisaro, uh, your thoughts. Thank you. Um, I, I, first of all, I, I have to concur with uh, Council Member Traeger. Um, you know, testing is, is going to be key. We have lots and lots of folks who are asymptomatic and, and potentially carrying uh, COVID-19. So it would be great to know before we go into a building whether or not we are at risk of infecting others. And, and to be able to stay out. Of course, money is, is always going to be an issue, but more so right now. But from the principal's perspective, again, we need to be able to look our staff in the eye, our staff members in the eye, our parents and our students in the eye to say, we have done everything we possibly can do within reason to make sure you are safe, which means we've checked all of our ventilation systems and made sure that they're up to snuff. We have made sure that we have all the PPE and all the hand washing materials and a nurse in every building and every single thing that has been recommended by the CDC and the Department of Health, all of that is here. We have the social and emotional supports that we need for the children. We have students and staff members and, and many of ourselves have been traumatized by this virus. We've lost folks that we haven't been able to mourn because we haven't been able to go to the, the services. Our school communities have lost people. So there is this whole combination of things that we're going to need. And again, the piece about the time in order to get this right and to make sure that we're able to, you know, communicate effectively and, and handle all of the pieces and, and target the students that we know need a little extra support. We need a little time to, to have these discussions and, and, and have this professional development. So thank you. Senator Mayer, your perspective. Well, I think we'll all agree that Mark sort of hit the nail on the head there, but I think we also need leadership. We need compassionate leadership that's smart and willing to uh, be strong. Now, people have had their challenges with Governor Cuomo during this, but the fact is he stepped up and exercised the kind of leadership that New York State needed during this period, which was to say, I'm going to base decisions based on science. Everyone is not going to like what I have to say, and I'm going to articulate why I am saying it. And I think, you know, every district, and I represent many, and I hear from districts all over the state, needs individual leadership at the superintendent or the municipal level that is willing to sort of get into the fray here and, and most of them are, and I'm not criticizing them, but this is a moment of real leadership. And I think that people have to step up and maybe do some things that are unpopular and you know, hold off on school opening until uh, everyone is, feels more confident than they do right now. We are we're in a moment of a lack of confidence, as Michael said, and uh, I think we need leadership to get through it. Michael, I'll pass this to you. I'm sure there's a, a long list here of, of mm. Concerns for you, for teachers to come back to school, but but if you could prioritize one or two, what what do you what would you really like to see in place before uh, coming back to in person instruction? 
Well, clearly the safety, but we, you know, I look at a school as the sacred asset of every community. Um, teachers have demonstrated over and over again that they're the guardians of their students. Uh, and they take that so seriously. And we saw that during the shutdown where they went above and beyond working 18 hours a day, going to the post office, mailing lessons to and work to children who couldn't do those things. I, I think we owe it to all the parents and the teachers to do everything that Mark just said in terms of the safety of the school building. Yeah, if we could work, wait, uh, if we have to wait, if we can't get COVID under control, um, then we might have to make the decision that we can't do anything until there is a vaccine. But at the same time, we have to try because we have, we have parents who are being put in horrendous situations about their own uh, ability to maintain a household, as well as teachers who, if we say, say, if we say we have to push and we disagree with the mayor or we do a job action, there'll be teachers who will be put in the same dilemma. The way you break through all of that is to do everything in your power that Mark was speaking about that the medical professionals are telling us. We do not have that in place at this moment. The mayor can make all the announcements he wants. It's just a fact they're not in place. Um, you know, we tried to do this planning in April and May and June and they did not want to engage until after 4th of July. Uh, but we have to get to this place and whatever time it takes to get there, then that, that's the time we need to take. But uh, in the end, it's really about this, vac this virus will pass and we have to make sure that our schools remain that most sacred asset in every community. And the only way to do that first and foremost is to show and demonstrate to everyone that we're watching after all of them. We're watching after the students, we're watching after the teachers, the principals, the guidance counselors, and the families and the parents. And that's what we need at this moment in time. Thank you. Um, Senator Liu, a final thought on this question about the safety of reopening, coming back to in-person learning. You've always appropriately advocated for in-person learning if it's possible and if it's safe. And, and so, so a final thought of something you'd like to see that would, would be an indicator that we're ready to bring kids back to school. Well, you know, it's, it's not so much what I think the indicator is. It's actually the most important thing for parents and the families are what the principals are thinking and what the teachers are thinking. Mm -hmm. If there are still teachers who are not going to school because they don't think it's safe, that sends a very powerful signal to parents and students. If the principals are not equipped or ready enough to answer parents' questions in the mornings when parents are accosting, literally accosting these principals, and the principals don't have the answers or they're not able to provide the supplies that are needed to keep people safe, that is, that, that is only going to create anxiety among the parents and, and get us even further away from in-person learning. So uh, as much as, look, I, I, have, I have my own thoughts, I have my own opinions, but I have largely uh, tried to emphasize the point that I'm not a doctor, I'm not a health professional, and I am not a professional educator. So what I want to do is help guide the policy through discussions such as this. And also Senator Mayer and I and our colleagues in the legislature, we understand and we've got a lot of questions about that, that our main responsibility is not to let this school system fall apart in the absence of, of funding. We're, we're really hoping that Washington will come through, but in, if they don't come through, we're not going to stand idly and say, oh, Washington failed us, and therefore we're going to let the schools get dismantled. No, we're going to have to come up with measures on our own. Senator Mayor mm -hmm. has a very strong proposal that I support for raising billions of dollars. There are other proposals out there. And so we're going to get to that point. Uh, but uh, that, is, that is what I think our main responsibility is, getting, delivering the resources so that our schools can be uh, operated properly, but leaving it up to principals and teachers to really make the real decisions that families and parents are actually going to be looking forward to. Yeah, thank you all for answering that question. I'd like to shift the focus just a little bit, and, and I'd like to bring in Tracy Walkus in to start off this, but it's ultimately something I, I, I'd love for every one of the panelists to share. You know, ultimately there'll be a day, and hopefully it's not too far away, maybe it's 18 months from now, maybe it's 24 months from now, that we're all going to go back to school. We're all going to feel safe again. We're all going to be able to go back into our, our school buildings. 
And when we think about that day, I'm, I'm curious what you think we have learned or what will we learn through this process that will actually make public schools in New York better? Like what will happen because of technology or because of us paying attention to some of the inequitable circumstances around the state or the lack of technologies? From your perspective, why will schools be better when we're finally safe and we're finally back to the new normal? And so, Tracy, I'd like to start with you, but then I'd really be interested in everyone's perspective on this question. It's a loaded question, David. Um, but I will say that everything that I've seen so far uh, is that education is really at a pivotal time and we're shifting and moving forward in leaps that we've never seen before. Uh, I said to someone last week, I think we may have advanced education 15 years in three months because when we're uncomfortable and we have to solve for new challenges is when we learn and find new solutions that are actually in some ways better for our students. And so I do feel that um, we will take away some of the things that we've learned from this and deploy them uh, in our schools. But I also am seeing a bigger community uh, reaction to everything. You know, we're seeing uh, uh, libraries and schools partnership, partnering together. I'm seeing, you know, healthcare facilities and school systems partner together in a way to sort of reclaim the central part of the community that schools have been uh, in this country for generations. And I really feel like that will allow us to improve and grow our place uh, in the educational space. Thanks, Tracy. Um, let's shift to Councilmember Traeger. I, I, would you mind carrying that on? What are you hopeful for? Where do you, what do you think we'll have learned through this process that will make schools in New York City in particular better? Uh, this is a very important question. And I wanna be very clear, uh, going back to, to the way things were is going in circles. Um, there are, you know, pre-existing conditions that were plaguing our school system prior to the pandemic, which is contributing to the reason why we can't fully reopen safely as well. You know, the fight for more nurses is not a new fight. The fight for more social workers is not a new fight. The fight to challenge food and housing insecurity is not a new fight. Uh, I believe my vision is that every single school in our city, uh, in our state, quite frankly, should be a community school to integrate services uh, such as tackling food insecurity, having food pantries, having full-time nurses, full-time social workers, counseling, health clinics. In some cases, some of the hardest hit COVID communities, the nurse in that school might be the only primary healthcare access point for that entire community, not just that school. So I believe that every single school should be a community school providing critical social emotional supports to meet the needs of the entire child. Because my philosophy is that regardless of what's happening in the world, in our schools, every child should feel safe, loved, supported. And we should really build that sense of community. And again, technology can be used to supplement that, that, that experience, but it can never substitute that, 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 that experience. There are things that will never be captured through an iPad or, or, through, or through a laptop. So that's what I like to see. Every school be a community school. Okay. Mr. Canisaro, from a principal's perspective and a school administrator perspective, um, what would you like to see? What, what do you think we'll have learned through this process? Well, first of all, I, I think we've all um, gotten a better appreciation for public education. Um, in the beginning of this pandemic, you know, you saw these funny memes on social media about parents saying how, you know, they, they quit their job to get a harder job. And, and you know, it, it, it was all in, all in good fun and jest, but um, it was also uh, serious, right? And, and the job of a teacher and an educator is a very difficult and challenging job. Just because we all seem to love it and have a smile on our face doesn't mean that we're, we're not working very hard. But that's one thing. The also, I mean, the, the thing that I keep hearing from this panel, and I tell you, I, we should have this panel together every day. We don't, I think we'd solve a lot of problems. But um, the, the thing I keep hearing from this panel is the supplemental instruction uh, of, of uh, remote that we've learned about. And being able to preserve lessons online for a student who may have been absent or sick or, or injured and unable to get back to school for a period of time for certain weather related emergencies, mm -hmm. being able to do so many things, right, that we, we never really thought 
of being able to do, um, you know, being able to make sure that we get uh, part of 180 days of instruction if we need to a couple of days remote. You know, there are systems around the world that go remote for a week every year just to test out their ability and their capability. So what I don't want to see happen is I don't want to see us lose what we have, right? When we go back in 18 or 24 or 12 or six months, we need to keep this remote piece alive so that if and when the next time comes, we're not starting over and reinventing the wheel. So I, I think that there is so much to gain and, and so many benefits from such a tragic event, right? Um, but, you know, Tracy said it, it it's, it's sort of like, you know, necessity is the mother of all invention. And, and here we go. We, we were in, in dire need and, and we've invented some things that we can't forget about when, in fact, we're back to, to regular uh, school day instruction. Thank you. Uh, Senator Mayer, uh, your perspectives, especially when it comes to the suburbs and outside of New York City. Well, I think we have to address the fact that our state funding methodology for funding public schools, while it was premised in 2007 on some basic legitimate principles, does not work effectively, is based on property tax wealth, is not a fair way to allocate absolutely essential resources. And this pandemic has made it very clear that we have these fundamental inequities that we absolutely need to fix. We in the Senate Democratic majority were looking at that with the eye towards fixing it before the pandemic. We have to commit as a state to move uh, out of the property tax way of funding the schools so that schools uh, don't have this fundamental inequity. But the second thing, and we haven't mentioned it today, we have to talk about it. The challenge for special needs students in an environment where we abruptly change from in-person to remote learning has had a very challenging time for them and their families and their teachers. We have to do better in factoring out how we're going to uh, make it work for them. So many of them slip behind, not just stayed neutral, slip behind without in-person learning. Uh, remote learning is not a great substitute for them and I think as a state, we need a stronger commitment to an effective model of educating them. Uh, but I think the funding methodology requires substantial oversight and review and take the, again, not politics, not in a punitive way, but in a fair way so that schools and kids get what they need. Yeah, thank you. That's powerful. And I really appreciate you bringing that up about our diverse learners and the needs of those learners and, and, and how, do we, how do we address instruction for those students in this environment. Um, let's shift. Uh, Michael, would you mind coming back and sharing again, you know, what would a teacher say about what they're hopeful for? What, is, what do they think will be better when this thing is over and we're back to pseudo normal school or the new normal school? Well, I, I think they'll just take a deep, deep breath and a sigh at that moment. But uh, the one thing that be, has be, you know, right now, I, the number of emails I'm getting as we approach the opening of school is the number one concern besides safety issues, obviously, is teachers saying, we have a new incoming class and we don't have relationships with them. That's such a, that is the secret to all education is that relationship you build between the teacher and the student. And it's always different with all sorts of different students. And that really takes that interaction one, uh, between the teacher. That's our skill, that's our craft. Uh, and they're very concerned, like, how am I gonna create that bond if I'm just using remote learning with a student? And maybe if I had, you know, if it's a blended learning model that, could be helpful, but they're really concerned about it. So I, that's something that we have to look at. The, we, it, that's sacred when it comes to teaching, it has to be there. But the piece about teachers working in teams, using technology, working off common curriculum, using the different strengths and weaknesses of the members on the team, to me, it, it, it seems that that is where education needs to start to move more and more, um, where the teacher understands that we, uh, we all understand that, you know, the majority of our work is first getting a student ready to learn. But then once we get them ready to learn, and if we're working with them in a team setting uh, where there'll be a group of students where a group of teachers are part of them, which is what we're going to have to endeavor, which is what we've been in, uh, we will endeavor this school year. Uh, to me, that would be extremely powerful. Uh, and it's something that we've been talking about for years. And it's one of the things that this 
you know, crisis has moved us towards. And to me, that's one of the things I think the teachers really uh, would look forward to. Uh, you know, when I started teaching, I'm, you know, it was the days of you were lucky if you got a bathroom key and they would check on you after a month to see if you were still uh, doing okay. There was no way to, that was no way to do education. Uh, and now it really should be about, you know, Mark's laughing. <laughs> it really should just be about, you know, as teachers are coming in, they become part of these teams and are working with groups of students and all working together. If we take that to a whole different level, then we can move towards what Mark is talking about because then a school really does become that central hub of just, so everyone looks at it much, much more than just a school. We're also doing all of these other services. To me, that's the, where I would like to really push education. And, I'm, and I know a lot of teachers have spoken to me about that. Thanks, thanks. Senator Liu, a final thought about your hope after the pandemic has ended and we're back to the new normal. What do you hope we have learned? I think that many of my fellow panelists have already talked about uh, things that we should have learned and will continue. And I agree with all those. I think the, the one point that hasn't been mentioned is the fact that we're actually now cleaning schools and cleaning schools thoroughly on a regular basis. That shouldn't stop because we still have, you know, we still have lots of, uh, the flu is still out there and it does get people sick. It keeps kids out of school. Uh, in normal times. So let's not let up on the, the school cleaning and the school maintenance. Keep everything uh, running well so that if and when another pandemic happens that we will be ready. In addition to all the lessons we have learned with remote learning and with the new tools that we've acquired uh, even during this pandemic. Yeah, thank you, Senator. Uh, you know, for me, I think it was just incredibly enlightening and reminded me about why we all care so deeply about public education. For each of you as panelists, you know, it's perfectly evidently clear your passion for kids and families and public education and making it work as well as it possibly can. Um, we've seen great innovation. I, I think one of the other things we all recognize is that incredibly difficult job of being a teacher and what it means to instruct different learners from what Senator Mayor talked about as uh, students with special needs, but also with students who are gifted. How do we, how do we design curriculum for, for gifted students or students above grade level and how do we continue to support them? How do we think about students with language challenges? How do we think about students that might have had sporadic schooling or have moved from other communities? or even students that move around New York City. I think that uh, Michael's comments about common curriculum are so powerful when we think about some of our fragile learners who move from neighborhood to neighborhood and sometimes get different kinds of supports as they move across the city or maybe even move out of the city into the suburbs in the center mayor's uh, community. Um, but I'm grateful for everyone on this panel and your time to, to offer insights. And I, again, I, I hope the one thing we learn is it will come, continue to come together as different kinds of stakeholders. Uh, private industry, uh, like myself and Tracy, uh, the, the legislators on the committee, representatives of teachers, the union, Department of Education, that we can all continue to come together to solve these kind of problems. And thank you again to city and state for this, for this session. I'll pass this back over to John. Bye-bye, right, thank, thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. everyone. Thanks, everyone. And thank, yeah, thank you to all of our panelists. Uh, very enlightening, informative discussion. Uh, we'll momentarily go to a special presentation uh, from Dave Barkley. Dave Barkley, if you want to hop on, uh, this is a special presentation, Student Dashboard for Google Classroom. Improve student focus and reduce parent frustration. Dave Barkley is a regional sales manager for Eastern Canada, Northeastern U.S., and GCC at Hapara. Uh, Dave, over to you. Great, thank you so much. And can you hear me all right? Just to make sure we're yep. in good shape, great. So, uh, yep, we're all planning for that new school year and the new normal. And so Hapara can help you do that. Uh, again, my name is Dave Barclay. I'm uh, a former classroom teacher and former IT director. So although I'm not in the trenches with you all now, uh, I certainly understand and, and certainly have a, a lot of empathy for what's going on uh, in the classrooms today. I do have a child entering fourth and fifth grade. so. I'm back in the, uh, you know, the at-home classroom uh, working in that regard. So real basically, Hapara fills the gaps in Google Education. So for those of you that are using Google Classroom, Google Apps for Education, G Suite, we work and we see where their gaps happen to be and provide tools for visibility 
and functionality to really help the schools get the most out of those great tools that Google has come to offer. And many of those schools having moved one-to-one -one specifically with Chromebooks, we're a great fit for you there. So today, I don't have a lot of time uh, to talk about the entire suite, but we're gonna talk about Hapara's student dashboard. This was a tool that was launched back in the spring and response has been phenomenal with this tool. What it's doing is again, it's providing that visibility and functionality where there happened to be a gap inside of Google Classroom that parents and students were really struggling with as they were working through the spring. And then again, as we're getting into the fall here, uh, we've working with a number of districts, getting them prepared and helping their parents and students uh, have more, find more success in the fall. So here we are, and this is a live version of the Hapara student dashboard. So we'll notice a few things right off the bat. You have your left hand window over here where we're on our to-do items. And we've also got access to your My Files. Up top here, you've got a, a drop down that you can select all of your classes. And then over here on the right, you've got a, a couple of other buttons regarding notification in her profile. So let's take a look at our to-do items. So here I'm looking at all of my to-do items in all of my classes. And I can filter this out by those that are overdue, those that have due dates, and those with no due dates. And this is really great for moms and dads uh, and, and those students that just have six or eight different uh, Google Classroom sessions going. I can now click on this and it's going to open that window up directly inside of Google Classroom. So there's really nothing new to teach your parents or students. They can, they're, they're functioning and working in Google Classroom as they had been before. Best part of student dashboard is there's no teacher training. This is something that you can roll out right now, day one, early September, and there's no need to train your teachers. If they were using Google Classroom last year, they can continue using Google Classroom in the exact same way. So this is all well and good. I can easily get to my assignments, but things really start to get interesting as I go down into my notifications. So again, we're looking at all of my classes and I'm looking at all of my notifications. And I wanna filter this down now. One of the challenges that I had, <clears throat> excuse me, that I had as a parent working with a fourth and, uh, third and fourth grade child last year is that they had their classroom, then they had math and ELA and then all of their specials. I had to bounce between any number of Google Classroom pages to try and get what the announcements happened to be that day. And then that Google Stream was full of announcements and assignments and quizzes and this, that, and the other thing. Well, here what we've done is we've identified that and now you can sort by type. So I wanna see all of my announcements from all of my classes. And I can click on any one of these and it's gonna bring me directly to that announcement inside of Google Classroom. Was there a question? Nope, okay. Now I wanna sort this down a little bit by one individual class. I wanna look at my second period language arts class. So now I'm looking at my assignments in my second period language arts class, and I'm looking at those individual announcements in my language arts class, and I can filter down to look at assigned work, work that's been returned, graded work, and email. So if they were to click on say graded work, it's gonna show that graded work item in there. I know mom and dad are definitely gonna to wanna to see that returned work up oh, in this class. I don't have any returned work. But the real big hit is for email. If you have not had the opportunity to look at a child's Gmail inbox that's using Google Classroom, this is what it looks like. And I'm not joking around. Ask anybody that's using Google Classroom and they are bombarded with notifications. New assignment, due tomorrow. New assignment, due tomorrow. Field trip. All of these messages coming from Google Classroom. And it, as a parent of those young children, they were getting 20 to 25 emails a day with this. Too much noise for parents and too much noise certainly for children. If we go into our email section here, inside of student dashboard, we'll notice that I'm looking at the email just from my second period language arts teacher. And again, I see my messages, I click on a message, it's gonna open up that email inside of Gmail, and now I can go about and do my work. If I wanted to find the same message inside my 
Gmail inbox, I would have to go through and I would have to probably search the mail and sort by teacher and sort by, it's too much. We can very easily, just within a few clicks, jump and find all of those email from that teacher. If I come over here and I wanna find email from say my history teacher, oh, no email from that teacher, great, we're in good shape. But that's the idea behind Student Dashboard. It's to provide students and their parents with the capability of jumping very quickly between their different classes and getting that very important information within just a few clicks. What's more is also down here on the My Files item. I'm gonna click on this. And during our research, uh, we noticed that students, they, we, we asked them, where do you go the most inside of Google Drive? And they said, shared with me and recent files. Well, we provided them direct access with that. Say so they go here, or again, within the recent files, they click on this and it's gonna open up that document right from, uh, right from student dashboard here. Now, this is all well and good, and we've made it, you're looking at this in a desktop view. Well, if we were to go down and shrink this down, we will notice, sorry, we will notice that this shrinks down perfectly well, so it looks great on a mobile phone. So it was designed with a mobile first interface. So now those buttons on the side show up on the bottom. There's no app for the child to download. They just go to this in their web browser on their phone. They can save it to their home screen and all of it's gonna resize so it will look perfect and very functional on their mobile device. Again, um, it has been a pleasure speaking with you all. I believe I'm entering the end of my time here, but I'd be happy to answer any questions in the time that we have left. But there's my contact information. Uh, it's dave.barclay at hapara.com. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure speaking with you all. Great, thank you, Dave, appreciate it. Um, I guess we'll send, we'll forward any questions we get from the audience directly to you. Um, otherwise, we'll go on to our next panel discussion. If you are on our second panel discussion, go ahead and bring up your video, unmute yourself. We'll get started momentarily. Uh, we've heard a lot about K-12 and, and the policy and practical issues there. Uh, obviously, universities and colleges are just as disrupted. Uh, this panel is Higher Education Plans for New York. And now I'd like to turn it over to New York City Council Member Inez Barron, the chair of the Higher, Ed Higher Education Committee who is our session facilitator. I believe all of our panelists are on, so let's kick it off. Uh, over to you, council member. Oh, great, thank you so much. I uh, appreciate being here. I want to thank city and state for hosting this event and for all of the panelists who have agreed to be with us today. I'm city council member Inez Barron. Oh, is John gonna do this now? Okay, I'm City Council Member Inez Barron, and uh, I have on board with me today several, counts, several panelists who are going to be able to talk to us Unmute. on the topic that we have today, which is talking about the impact of the pandemic on higher education in New York State. And we've got several distinguished panelists that are here, and I'm going to ask them as I them to make brief comment opening coming back on I think okay, okay. she was off we have with us perhaps are you ready state senator Toby Stavisky you're ready if not I ready. always ready particularly for my friend the councilwoman Great. Hi, so hi. just tell us briefly who you are introduce yourself thank you Real quick, my name is Toby Stavisky. Um, I'm a former high school teacher in New York City for about six and a half years. Uh, and I've been in the Senate for 20 years and I chair the Committee on Higher Education. Thank you, Thank you so much. And our next panelist is uh, Commissioner, State Education Commissioner, Catherine Collins. Dr. Collins, if you're on, you can introduce yourself to us. Dr. Collins, you're on mute. 
Sorry for a minute there. I forgot to click the little button that unmuted. And my name is uh, Dr. Katherine Collins. I live in uh, Western New York. I'm a member of the Regents. I'm in my second term and I co-chair Higher Ed. And I thank you so much for inviting me today to talk about some of the things that I think, pardon me, someone talking to me? Okay. Um, to talk about the things that I think are very important uh, for our students. I've spent Thank you so many much. Thank you. We're going to come back with the questions. We're okay. going to move on now. We're going to have Deputy Commissioner Bill Murphy introduce himself. Thank you, Councilwoman. This is, uh, again, Bill Murphy. I'm Deputy Commissioner for Higher Education for the State Education Department. Um, prior to that, I was uh, in senior leadership positions related to uh, the Office of Professions for Professional Licensure, and I'm really looking forward to participating today. Thank you. Thank you so much. We're going to have now Senior Director Noel Hara. Hello, thank you for having me here today. I'm Noel Hara with NTT Data, and really since March when the pandemic started, I've been working to look at a existing things that were in our portfolio, both from a public safety perspective and, and healthcare perspective to help students get back to campus safely. And then also looking at adapting technology portfolios that are used for en large enterprises and government agencies for their workers who are remote to help students who are going to be synchronously learning remote with the right tools and equipment and support. Thank you. Next, we're going to have Access Evangelist Senior Customer Manager, Scott Reddy. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you. My name is Scott Reddy, and I am with Verbit. We provide captioning, both live and post-production to institutions of higher education. I work pro, uh, with a number of institutions in the New York State and in helping them to provide access, especially during this transition, while everybody is trying to meet the needs of education, we are wanting to also make sure that access is provided to those students with various uh, accommodation needs. Thank you. President Mark Johnson from Monroe College is also with us. Hello, guys. President Mark Jerome from the Bronx in New Rochelle. I I'm sorry. That's okay. Johnson. I'm Jerome. sorry. I had the wrong. <laughs> Jerome Avenue is how you remember okay. me. I'm Mark <laughs> Jerome, and I work on Jerome <laughs> Avenue in the Bronx. Um, been teaching urban students for 26 years. Our two campuses are on two of the hottest COVID spots in the nation. And I love nothing more other than trying to help them succeed and get through the difficult time. Thanks for having me on. Thank you, Dr. Monroe. And now we have President Michael Smith from Berkeley College. Right, thank you so much. So Berkeley College has been in this uh, educational market for 90 years at this point. I've been with Berkeley for 24 years last five years as president. Our, our focus is to get our students graduated to the graduation stage and on to lifelong career success. That's what we've been doing. And it's the same whether it's online or on site. So that's what Berkeley College is about. Thank you so much to all the panelists. Uh, we did have an opportunity to meet earlier and talk about how we would present ourselves. And what we have decided is that we have a large panel so we're not going to have each panelist talk on each of the topics, but particular panelists will address specific topics. So the first area that we're going to be looking at is the potential budget impact on what it is that COVID is going to do in terms of colleges setting up those kinds of, uh, kinds of situations. So particularly talking about finances, we're going to go to our state senator, Toby, to talk about some of the financial impacts that she sees. I think it's state more senator. financial. I'm not muted. Yes, I think no, it's we more hear you. The, the, the impact we're afraid will occur uh, because without uh, some additional help, there have to be cuts. And in fact, um, New York State really hasn't recovered from 
uh, and particularly higher education has not recovered from the 2008 uh, uh, recession and the budget cuts that uh, ensued from that. Um, first of all, uh, to me, there are a couple of areas. One is the impact on programs. Uh, federal stimulus money is so essential to continuing in the best way possible, the programs, whether it be the public or the private or the proprietary colleges. Uh, the CARES Act provided SUNY with 300 million, CUNY with 236 million, and the independent colleges with 286 million, half of which go to students. Um, the, one of the solutions, I think, uh, is legislation that I am sponsoring with Senator Shelley Mayer, the chair of the Senate Education Committee, which we call the SHARES Act, which requires a, an increase in the personal income tax on those people earning millions and millions of dollars per year. And that money would be dedicated both to uh, K through 12 and also to higher education. Uh, proportionate to uh, their part of the budget. Um, secondly, and to me most importantly, is the impact on the students. Um, we have a massive decline in enrollment. I am convinced, uh, and everybody is facing that decline, which means less money is going to be available in terms of the tuition payments. Um, and as a result, um, Students have been forced out of the dormitory. Some have no place to go. Uh, there's no campus life for the students, no jobs available, no internships. Um, and to me, the most important part is the safety of the students, the faculty and the staff. That is essential. Um, there are, taught, the state is talking about cuts to the Excelsior Scholarship. Uh, but even more significantly, I am very concerned that there not be cuts to the tuition assistance program and the opportunity programs because right. they make the difference. And it's I think really very important, and uh, particularly in, in fact that, the, that we know that so many students rely on TAP for the tu tuition, but in addition to that, the related educational costs are not covered. So if we're now going to talk about cuts to TAP, that's very significant. Uh, Mark Jerome, I would ask you if you'd also join in on the comments here. Sure. Well, Senator Stavitsky was right on point. Um, I'll point out there were two trends going against each other. On the one hand, we have the students suffering financially, emotionally, and in all kinds of ways because of the pandemic, needing the most resources. And at the same time, we have this great pressure to reduce the resources. So as Senator Stavitsky said, I really pray we keep the TAP budget. It's one of the most important, effective programs we have, and I see it firsthand every day. The second thing is the CARES Act, which did give a billion dollars to New York colleges, and we received around 11 million, had a, a major impact on students. We gave out $1,000 to every single student in cash, and it made a big impact. And so we hope the federal government comes through with more of that. Uh, thank you so much. Our next topic that we're going to move on to is the general topic of the status of reopenings. I heard today that the University of North Carolina, within the first week of the openings of classes, has now reversed itself and are not having any in classes, in person classes and all instruction will be via remote. So let's move to that topic. And uh, I'll ask Bill Murphy if he would like to share with us his thoughts on that. And we'll move on to other panelists after that. Yes, thank you, Councilwoman. Um, so you're right. Uh, it's really the unpredictability since the, since the middle of March, really, when this started to hit our campuses. Um, it's, it started to hit our campuses actually a little bit sooner than the general community and P12 because they had international students that they had to bring back from abroad where it started to hit different parts of the, of the uh, world. And since that time, we've been trying to come up with, with the field uh, and the stakeholders involved, we've been trying to figure out uh, our co-chairs, Regent Collins, Regent Passion, the commissioner and chancellor, we've been trying to say, 
what is it that we need to do to make sure we're giving either the regulatory flexibilities or policy flexibilities and to make sure that the campuses can not only just sustain and make sure that they keep their programs going, but to make sure that we're ready for this reopening in, in the fall that, that's upon us now. So since that time, really one of the first things right out of the gate was you need to give us flexibilities on distance education. And, you know, kind of the misnomer there is people think that 